Okay, welcome everyone to this GoGen session where we are going to be introducing our third cohort of fellows. I have a short presentation. I'm going to try to share right now. So just uh, to summarize a bit, what's the uh, GoGen Fellowship Scheme? Is uh, it was designed uh, in this third phase of GoGen uh, to support uh, GoGen alumni and uh, members in the uh, last step of the PhD, basically uh, after PhD. So um, it uh, it could be designed in different ideas. So we have, we have seen how fellows have uh, chosen different topics, but basically it was about undertaking a, a piece of uh, uh, targeted uh, OER, OEP research as well. Uh, it could be designed for OER activity in a particular region and uh, I mean, as well, identification of events, the dissemination of GoGN in a way of fostering connections to other networks and, and growing up for GoGN, in that sense, promoting GoGN um, because of the pandemic, many cases on online events. And uh, well, the output uh, are um, three blog posts, which uh, uh, are accessible from uh, previous fellows on our site and as well um, a report. The idea of the report is that it's uh, quite uh, uh, friendly and uh, with the idea that after this uh, third court we'll have a um, handbook with all the reports. So kind of representing the different experiences. So in that sense, the first court, so our fellows from 2020 and quite difficult times mm -hmm. because of the start of the pandemic when they actually started and uh, what they were actually going on and going with their, with their research. And uh, so we have two examples, Joe and Virginia, who actually decided to pick a topic that was related to their PhD. And uh, then Judith uh, decided to do uh, a fellowship that was about uh, networking and, and uh, letting know uh, in Africa about the network and uh, recruiting new members. And uh, Chrissy uh, came with a different idea uh, that we uh, wasn't aware of uh when uh, designing the schema so the scheme so uh, is that a together picture book uh, as you probably have uh, heard about it and it's been uh, awarded by oe global and in the end involved a uh, nice group of uh, of researchers uh the second court uh just finished with uh, sarah who as well decided to have a fellowship a link with her uh, own research in equity and inclusion in the australian context and uh, Verena, who is here with us today as well, and we discuss later uh, about the open podcasting project, so they get dedicated to podcast. So uh, we have just started with the third court, and uh, that means we are going to have a total of nine fellows, and all information is available on our website. So welcome to our third court. This is the formal uh, presentation for Catherine, Vivian, and Michael, who will have the opportunity today to let us know uh, their proposals and, uh, and uh, allow some discussion with participants and uh, ideas how uh, to support them as well. We are in a friendly environment. And, uh, and then we'll have a conversation with uh, Verena about her experiences uh, uh, with her Finnish fellowship. And this is when I set up and let uh, Catherine uh, present for us. Thank you, Paco. Um, I, someone was knocking on my door just as you're about to introduce me, the, the joys of working from home. But I will share my screen. Um, let's see. Is that visible okay? Yeah, that's okay. okay. That's great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, Paco, you, uh, is it possible for you to give maybe like a one minute or two minute warning if I'm still speaking? I have, I have a timer on, but I don't want to, I definitely don't want to go over. Sure, I can help you with that. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. I think I'm just going to start with um, my second slide <laughs> because um, I just want to thank, um, obviously, GoGN uh, for the opportunity to do the fellowship and this network. Um, I think I, I was thinking I first started engaging with the network, uh, obviously, during my PhD research. I think it was 2015, 2016. Um, and I've been a participant in GoGN workshops with my fellow fellows, uh, Viv and Michael, and also Marina and Sarah. 
Um, so it feels like being with uh, friends and co-travelers today. And Glenda, I think you were one of the first people I spoke to about encouraging me about the network. So um, I always remember that um, early conversations with you. Um, so, it, and I have observed the fellowship projects that have gone on already and been really inspired by just the diversity across those and the creativity. So um, that's, that's been a real bonus for me um, in, um, coming in in this third cohort. Um, and just the notion of the fellowships and supporting us as our work evolves and as just the challenges really in the world around us evolve as well, I suppose. Um, and I just wanted to pause and acknowledge that um, and share this quote, um, which forms part of another project um, that have been a part of Equity Unbound. Um, the only way to make borders meaningless is to keep insisting on crossing them. Like a refugee without papers, without waiting to be given permission, without regard for what might be waiting on the other side. For when you cross a border, you're not only affirming its permeability, but also changing the landscape on both sides. Um, and this is from, um, some of you may know this, this article, it's an extraordinary um, piece of writing by Lena Maunzer, who's a translator based in Beirut. Um, and she wrote about her work translating women's accounts of war in Syria. And we used this notion of equity unbound and crossing borders um, it, as it relates to intercultural learning originally, but it's just, you know, it's immensely apt today, of course, as we're witnessing war and violence and racism and refugee crisis. So um, I would say just from my own point of view on kind of the Western edge of Europe, it feels very close geographically, but I think probably for every one of us, no matter where we are, it's really close in the human sense. Um, so obviously we just kind of engage with that um, about it through you know, our personal actions and also through our work. And you know, we do have an opportunity, I think, in the field of work that we're all engaged in open education um, to somehow um, help, at least in, in a values sense. So as has already been mentioned in the conversation before we started, you know, the, the two years of the pandemic, which obviously has felt like longer, um, gave us a greater focus on open and how it can further access and equity potentially. Um, but the current war and all of that, that it entails, I think is even further impetus. For me, it feels like further emphasis on these core values um, and what we can do individually and collectively. So um, the name of my project is Just Knowledge and it's about sharing community-based knowledge. And it's in the very early stages. So I'll just share what, what, um, what exists now and I'm gonna invite your, your ideas and feedback. Um, I really welcome that. So I'm now working independently outside of a higher education institution or organization for the first time in many years. And I would like to use this different positionality to widen the lens and consider um, the larger values of higher education about furthering public good and well-being for all. So the idea that I brought to the GoGN Fellowship, which was um, approved, was to explore potential applications of open educational practices, broadly speaking, beyond the formal curriculum and beyond mainstream teaching and learning, but really with community focused um, initiatives. So it's really a community focused open knowledge project. Um, and I plan to collaborate with um, a few community based initiatives that and explore how the use of open digital approaches to sharing knowledge can support them based on their current aims and current challenges. Um, I'm clear, uh, although the partners are still emerging, I'm clear about the underlying principles of the project and I borrowed those from data feminism. And I know a lot of you are familiar with this work. It's approach to data science and data ethics that's informed by intersectional feminism. Um, and the book is by um, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein. Um, so these seven principles, you know, they're not strange to any of us who work in kind of critical and social justice approaches to open, but they really are relevant, I think, to open and specifically open knowledge. So first one is examine power and how power operates. So, you know, many of us ask those questions like, um, you know, who is open for, uh, open by whom, open in whose interests, those are the kinds of questions we ask when we examine power with respect to open. Challenging power, so really kind of challenging those power structures and working towards justice. Elevating emotion and embodiment and all the messy parts of, you know, knowledge and um, 
valuing multiple forms of knowledge. Uh, number four, rethinking binaries and hierarchies. Again, this is very familiar to many of us who work in open because binaries often hide hierarchies. Um, number five is embracing pluralism, and that's really relevant to this project because it's that would, that would be about prioritizing local and experiential forms of knowledge. So that was my impetus for really centering this on community-based organizations and initiatives. The sixth principle is considering context. Again, familiar to us working in open, um, and you know, open of course is not neutral, and it's a matter of being alert to inequalities. Uh, when we're working in this space and making labor labor visible by recognizing and valuing all labor. So obviously these are, as Dignazio and, and Klein explain really well, this, these, this is like a goal, both a goal and a process, um, but those are really the principles underlying the project. So, so what is it? Uh, what, what am I planning to do? Um, basically, it's um, the project description is I'm calling it a community focused open knowledge research project guided by three core ideals, justice, equity and openness. And the initial aims, again, I have the core ideals of justice, equity and openness and the intersectional feminist principles. So the initial aim is really to collaborate with three very different community based knowledge initiatives um, and and really through collaborating with them, seek to understand what their aims are and particularly what their challenges are, maybe even particular challenges in this kind of pandemic slash post pandemic time that we're in. Um, and then to explore the use of open approaches to share knowledge, um, you know, in ways that are, you know, equitable and relevant and important um, to those groups. So I invited three partners, which I had outlined in my um, application and I'm in conversation with two of them now, one is still um, to be determined. So, but I can't, um, I can't share the details of the partners yet because working with community initiatives, it's a matter of getting agreement from multiple partners and which is fine, but I'm, um, what I'm planning is that as soon as that is all firm, I'll share this information in my first blog post because then I'd really love to, um, to, to get more feedback on that. But in a general sense, at least the one project is about mapping, the project wants to map locations of importance for an indigenous ethnic minority um, here in the West of Ireland. Um, and this project is ongoing and it was the maps were done on paper initially. And so they're looking to move them to digital and possibly open um, maps. And the second one is a network on sustainability in the community. And they, you know, when I approached them and described what, what could be possible if they were willing to engage in the project, they were really excited because they're at a really early stage and they really want to explore what open could mean um, for their network. And both of these have um, partners within higher education institutions, but are very much driven by the community needs. So they, there's a link to higher education, but they're driven by, um, by the community. Um, so, I don't want to say much more than that. I mean, I, I can't give any more details, but I think I've, I've tried to explain the rationale, the impetus behind it, and I will share more details um, in a few weeks, but I think I'll stop speaking and just get um, thoughts from you all here. And here is Verena, here's a photograph <laughs> I took uh, about two weeks ago, just a little further down the coast from where I live. And tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day, so I couldn't miss the opportunity to say happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. That's it. Thank you very much, Catherine. Mm -hmm. so now it's time to discuss. Uh, so anyone wants to? Um, Catherine, congratulations. I, I think you have a terrific project. I wonder if you'd be interested because um, I follow many, um, I've been following many scientists um, on Twitter, uh, especially women who are sharing information about the, the pandemic um, and the virus for free. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether you'd be interested in connecting with them for your project, since this is a feminist approach that you're taking. And because they're, they're sharing information for free, they're not getting paid to do so. Yeah. So if, if that would be of interest to you, I would be happy to connect you. Um, I, I would love that. Um, what I'm finding is sometimes, you know, like the data feminism book, for example, is full of examples, different community examples. And sometimes it could be about something really 
different from one of the projects that I'm working with, but just the way they're working or a particular aspect of the approach ends up prompting ideas. Um, and one of the selling points of, of that I, I, I approached these potential partners with was just saying that I would share what they're doing with this global group and that we would then, I would be able to bring back ideas or contacts for them, you know, to make their own contacts with people. Um, so that would be fantastic, Viv, thank you. Great, so I'll connect you to them because uh, they speak English and which is a plus. And, you know, they, they've been just, putting in a lot of work to keeping the population, the Brazilian population informed uh, about the you know, virus pandemic, the evolution and so on. And so th this is open really. Um, and that would be great. I know, great. Men, I know men too, but I would connect you to the women since you're taking on this feminist approach. Well, men can be feminists also. I think there might even be a few here in, yeah, the, in the group. I, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't think the scientists, um, the, the male scientists would have, you know, but, but I would first try to connect to the women and then if that works out, you could go on from there. Okay, thanks, Viv. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I think Chrissy wanted to ask something. And Verena? Yes. Mm -hmm. Christy, go ahead first. Oh, you know, I didn't actually have a question. I pushed the wrong button. I wanted to clap. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I, I like the I like the idea very much, um, Catherine. And I think it's really important that you look outside HE since you are not just because you are outside HE, but I was wondering, and I, I do have now a question while I started talking, <laughs> how how could that lend, link also into HE? Because you talk about crossing boundaries. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what I wrote in my application was that I, I don't have any preconceptions about what we could learn from this, but that would be the idea with that I would be look at differences or similarities across those and kind of bring that back and see what what learnings could be brought back exactly you know, into into us and AG. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Virginia. Um, Catherine, this sounds so exciting. So I'm so yeah, encouraged by uh, the topic. I have two questions. One, um, in my dissertation research, the fourth iteration, we extended it into and with Indigenous communities. So when you start going there, I'd love to have a conversation about how that how that worked for you or, you know, if you get if and when you get there, um, because I'm curious about the pathway that will happen for you, I guess, or how those boundaries are explored. Maybe that's a better way of thinking about it. Um, but the second thing is, I loved the use of community-based knowledge initiatives. What, where are you getting that term from? Or where, where, like, what do you think, what are you thinking when you say that? I was really curious when I heard it at first and I waited for you to explain, you know, what you were thinking. So yeah, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, some of the work that's being done, you know, within higher education is about expanding our conception of higher education as thinking about them as open knowledge institutions. Um, but if we expand even the notion of knowledge itself um, as multiple and situated and so on, I just want to look at knowledge arising from specific communities, you know, that, that are really specific um, with specific aims and particularly um, marginalized communities, you know, where possible, you know, that aren't getting the attention and the resources and the focus and so on. So, so that, you know, that term kind of pulls in a lot of those values and I'm glad it resonated, but that was, that's where it came from. Thanks, thanks just for explaining yeah. things. I think Michael as well wanted to add something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Congratulations as well. Um, what came to mind for me was this idea of like knowledge mobilization. It's something they talk a lot about in the, the research here in Canada. I don't know if that's a term that's familiar to others, but it's about how do we leverage the engagement that higher ed has with communities and in institutions and organizations and respectfully try to make sure that that is as widely accessible and um as accessible as possible so it just said just another term you might find that could help with literature or supporting it but thank um, you i'm so grateful for that because i hadn't 
I hadn't, I wasn't aware of that. And honestly, I was thinking of, you know, I was thinking of you and Verena and others in Canada and also like Joanna and Sarah and Australia, you know, that, you know, people who have already been working in this space that I know I can learn from. So, um, and we'll keep the conversation going hopefully, but thank you. Yeah, I'll share a resource because I know uh, Jess was looking for it too. I'll just put it in the chat. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. And I think it was great in terms of getting some feedback so and contact. So that, that's great, I think. Uh, now uh, we are gonna uh, move on to our next presenter, uh, Vivian. I'll, I'll be playing the slides, so I'm gonna be showing uh, my screen one second. Okay, thank you for that, Paco. I hope I can move, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to, to move on for me. Well, first of all, I, I would also like to thank uh, Gojian for this fellowship. Um, a huge thank, for, uh, thank you to you. Uh, I've also been part of, uh, I've been a member of Gojian since uh, 2016, and it has been really awesome to be able to connect. I've learned a lot uh, from my peers. And I was kind of hesitant uh, to apply for this scholarship because um, I thought, um, I don't, this fellowship, as a matter of fact, I, you know, I thought, well, I, I really wanted to do something that was worthwhile for Brazil, but I wasn't sure whether I could or could not. And I've been facing a lot of difficulties. Uh, so a huge thank you to Gojen. And today I'm gonna to be presenting to you, if you can move on to the next screen, please, Paco. Um, Next one, please. Um, going to talk to you a little bit about um, my project and we can jump on to the next, uh, because I, I have already started uh, analyzing some data. So what happens is uh, what I'm doing, if you could move to the next one, please, Marco, uh, is that I've been, uh, I started recruiting because uh, I think this, this is what happened in most countries, but in Brazil, all schools, and this is uh, basic education, higher education, were basically shut down in March of 2020, and they only returned in June of 2021, okay? So that was a long time uh, of schools being shut down, uh, which really disrupted the teachers, the students, and everybody. And they started coming and teachers at schools, and I'm going to be now focusing on K-12 education, which is what my project is on. Uh, the teachers uh, received in June a priority to be vaccinated. Uh, so then the schools could then uh, reopen again, and the kids just started uh, being vaccinated uh teenagers were vaccinated last year and the kids only this year we've had a lot of problems with vaccination vaccinations came late uh, we've had to fight for uh to be vaccinated here in brazil because our president is is against he's a COVID denier so it's it, it's you know education uh, health and all of that has been very convoluted by politics here in brazil um so the criteria for inclusion uh, in my study is, is that the participants be a K-12 public te uh, school teacher and that they possess knowledge uh, of OER. So what I did was I got in contact uh, with a person who I know uh, who did her, her doctoral, uh, part of her doctoral degree was to develop a design-based research. Uh, she's design-based research methodology. So she developed a course on OER. So I contacted her in January. I said, listen, so you developed this fantastic course. And I, I, I want to interview these teachers because I want to know um, if during this pandemic and during specifically emergency remote learning, uh, the, these teachers who already knew what OER and OEPs were uh, resorted to using uh, them or not, okay? So that's the basic goal of my dissertation. 
Um, another goal is to better understand the challenges faced by these teachers. And we're talking about public school teachers. So keep in mind that they in themselves are a whole different category. Um, so also to incorporate perspectives and experiences of, um, uh, of these teachers during the period of crisis and to develop a framework or guidelines to catalyze a better path for the future. And this framework, uh, basically the idea for a framework for these guidelines arose because when I sent out the initial recruitment um, uh, email uh, from 15 teachers, I had a list of 15 teachers, I only got response, uh, you know, uh, willingness to volunteer from four teachers. And so I'm trying to get some teachers from Canada, but then in the end, I also decided, you know what, I'm going to stick to Brazil. So I've got four teachers. Um, it's not a lot. It's like a mini, mini, mini case study. Uh, but they've been giving me some valuable data, which I'll share with you quickly here. Um, and I think from that, I'm going to try to develop a framework or guidelines um, on how we move forward especially in times of crisis, okay? So Paco, if you could please move on to the next slide. Um, so this is basically uh, the process methodology. Um, I'm holding interviews uh, with four stakeholders. The last interview is going to be today. Uh, I'm getting all the data, uh, analyzing it using in vivo, categorization, coding. Uh, then I plan to send back the data, uh, the findings, and I'll be uh, posting that blog in, uh, on the GoGen site soon uh, for member checking, and then I'll be disseminating results to presentations. I'm going to be presenting this at OER22, uh, presenting final reports, and so on and so forth. Paco can go on to the next slide. So I'm not going to go over all these questions, but it's just so you guys have an idea. Okay, these interview questions were developed from scratch, um, and basically they were aimed at understanding where these teachers are coming from and their experiences, if they were, if they did, or if they did not use OER, and so on and so forth. If we can move to the next slide, please, Paco. So here are. Three uh, teachers who have participated, and the most interesting thing is, and this I didn't know before, is that they represent three different regions from Brazil, and all of them hold the master's degree, and they work with different uh, in different subject areas. So I have one that teaches Portuguese literature, foreign languages, another one who teaches uh, childhood education, specific literacy, and another one who teaches history and geography uh, and geography. And they have a lot of experience teaching, which is good. And the fourth one, I don't know yet because uh, this person will be interviewed today. Paco, if we can move on to the next slide. So here are some of the findings that I already have, okay? And uh, what I've highlighted is what I think is important, okay? So Paco, please stop me if you think, uh, you know, I'm going over time or not. But what happened was that at the start of the, uh, the pandemic, there were no directions, no directives from the government. Um, there were no rules or regulations on what teachers should do, nor from the federal government, nor from the state governments. Basically, nobody knew what to do. So teachers were pretty much left to their own devices. And this is something that I also found during my, uh, which is in my uh, doctoral dissertation, that many teachers and the students uh, had no prior experience using ICTs, synchronous classes, or asynchronous classes. And the teachers, and this is from the data already, uh, said that although you know most of the students are digital natives, they've never had to use ICTs for learning purposes. So basically, um, the teachers who are involved in the study, they learned by doing, which is interesting. If we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so in essence, the schools, the public schools here in Brazil are not prepared for hybrid teaching and learning. 
And also there's another very serious concern, which is the lack of knowledge and skills of the school director and pedagogical coordinator for remote learning, distance learning, or the use of ICTs in general, okay? Paco, next one, please. So then I asked the teachers, well, then who did you resort to? Because, you know, uh, so one teacher stated that she had previous experience because she had taken a course. Don't forget that these teachers all hold the master's degree. Um, and then some of the state governments, and I'm referring to the state governments that have a higher index of economic development, which are in the south and southeastern part of Brazil, uh, did provide training on Google Classroom and its tools, and that's what they resorted to using. And the teachers all resorted to Google and YouTube for instructional material, not necessarily looking for openly licensed material. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are the technologies that teachers use remotely. Uh, they use a lot of WhatsApp because we use a lot of WhatsApp here in Brazil uh, to communicate. Uh, so this they used to exchange info between teachers. Uh, they used Google Classroom. They use YouTube channels. One teacher from the north, uh, the northern part of Brazil, uh, used said that there was a TV program that was created by state government. And the WhatsApp was also uh, used due to students' digital exclusion because uh, although many students in the public uh, educational system do not have access to the internet, they do have mobile phones. Next slide, please. So here are some of the main pedagogies they use. Uh, they use uh, WhatsApp to participation. They use the textbooks, which they already use uh, nowadays. They make cartoons, comic strips, news articles, videos. But one thing they stated is that they felt that they were basically um, uh, replicating face-to-face -face classrooms. When, whenever, whenever they had to deliver synchronous classes, they, they felt that they were basically replicating face-to-face -face classes. So, that is how unexperienced they were. Uh, and then one teacher said he produced his own instructional materials. Next slide, please. So this is where it gets interesting because reminding you, uh, this is my main question, okay? Uh, if they did use OER, okay? Uh, well, one thing I heard was that there was lack of time and work of alert to search for and develop OER. Many of them, um, those that I interviewed still don't know where the main repositories, repositories are here in Brazil, uh, but they did develop uh, some lessons using OER, uh, usually using uh, repositories or public domain uh, works. Um, and then one of the instructors said to me, I said, well, but did you, how did you license the material? And she responded, well, basically what I did was I copy and pasted the license. So, you know, that, that's an effort at, at, at attempting to use OER. Uh, another teacher stated uh, she developed videos and cards, uh, but this teacher has more practice with OER. And um, another teacher said that basically what she did was she, she developed OER uh, from scratch for literacy. And this was an interesting finding. Next slide, please. Uh, so here I asked about the collaboration with other teachers and use of open education practices. And basically here, I think what I highlighted, what's important to say is that they resorted to open educational practices to share material and to ask for help. And they did share instructional material via WhatsApp and Facebook. And Facebook is also, again, a big thing here in Brazil. People resort to it a lot. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so then when I got to the part that I asked, well, how, how did you assess uh, students for engagement learning? You know, they all kind of gave me this look kind of like, what are you talking about? And so I tried to extract some more information because that's an important part in the learning and teaching process, right? 
So one teacher stated to use project-based learning, the other one stated collaborative cooperative learning, another one said that they should try to obtain regular student feedback and activities. But one thing that came up is that this was a consensus among teachers that anywhere from 20 to 30% of the students appeared not to have engaged in remote learning. And this was even worse when they came back to class was that they seemed to have not learned anything. So the cognitive impairment uh, was really big. So next slide, please. So here I asked if they plan to use OER and OEPs in face-to-face -face classrooms. And yes, uh, most teachers that I interviewed said that they were planning to, and, and this was something that they really had appreciated taking this course beforehand, because now they know what OER is. And one teacher says that she even plans to disseminate, she has a project for disseminating OER in her school. Next slide, please. So here are basically suggestions and lessons learned, okay? And I think I'm not gonna go over this whole list, but what I've highlighted is what is important, okay? Uh, what, the, what the pandemic did uh, here in Brazil, it really highlighted the existing digital exclusion. So we already knew about that, but it exacerbated this digital exclusion, okay? Because uh, many, uh, students, especially elementary school students, they depended on receiving uh, textbooks and having help from their parents to study remotely, and they did not have that. So that is that that is also a problem. So uh, this led to teachers noting deficiencies in students' learning. So definitely, there was a cognitive impairment due to the pandemic, and. Finally, there is need to disseminate OER and provide incentives. And this came from the teachers. This is not me saying, okay? Uh, which would be not monetary, but rather in prices or awards for those teachers who create or use them. And this is an interesting finding uh, because it shows that they don't really care about the money. What they want is the recognition because teachers in general feel uh, they have no value here in Brazil. They, they, they've been receiving the same salary since 2013. And so all of the politics involved in education, uh, the educational policies have to be changed, altered in a way. Next slide. So that pretty wraps up my presentation. This is what I will be posting on, on as my first blog post after I interview. Uh, my fourth participant today. And so thank you very much, guys. And, and I'm open to any thoughts, questions that you have. Thank you, Paco. Any question? I can see everyone clapping. And uh, yeah, one hand, Chrissy. Oh, Jamit. Okay, sorry. I said I will ask a question, uh, Viv. Um, th thank you for introducing us to your project. Um, from from what you have said, uh, things have not been very dissimilizing from what has been the case in in other countries, and that's that's worrying i mean it's interesting you know that this, to hear about the similarities uh, and not just in higher education but also in the school sector it is worrying um but what can we do about it so i'm very much looking forward into seeing what you are such going to suggest um my my question is linked to um i can't remember my question now <laughs> my question was about Oh, I can't remember. I didn't write it down and I started talking about something else and now it's gone. If somebody else wants to ask and I'll come back. I need to collect my, my thoughts. Well, you can always send it to me by email and it's okay. To... It will come back to me when somebody else. Talks. Okay. <laughs> Any other question? Thanks, Vivian. Um, I see some synergies in our projects, which is really exciting. I wonder if there's ways we can um collaborate we had similar situation here in canada 
uh, people trying to replicate things online, um, not with much support, uh, lots of tools thrown at um, teachers, which might be different than in your context. But um, just think it's so important because the uh, research around K-12 and OERs are, is so limited, uh, but there's so much potential. So I'm just really excited uh, about your research. Thanks, Michael. I'm excited too. I wish I could have gotten more participants because really um, it would give, it would provide me with sounder data. Uh, but it's been a real challenge. You know, I even offered to help teachers to create OERs in exchange for, you know, participating in the study. I posted it all over the place on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and, and it's really hard. And I knew that that was a limitation uh, before when I spoke uh, to both Paco and Beck, we discussed this limitation. So I, I'm really looking forward to, your, to hearing about your project. Um, yes, we are, we are aware, but I have to say you have been very proactive trying to find solutions. And I was thinking another person you might like to talk with is uh, Virginia, because her fellowship was uh, as well around the area of K K twelve in uh, in the uh, Uruguayan context. So I think I think there can be some interesting conversations there. And uh, well, I think it's time to move to uh, uh, our third fellow. So Michael, Chrissy, I saw you. you had, your question had come back to you. I I, I, I want you to go ahead. Oh, Chrissy, uh, yeah, thank sorry, you. <laughs> we're mute. Thank you, thank you, you Michael. Talking. Yes, thank you, Michael. Yes, my question came back to me as soon as I said I can't remember it, which is very typical. <laughs> really sorry. Um, Viv, you mentioned that um, the educators don't have time. And again, that's something very, very common. You know, we hear that a lot. But I, I was involved recently in a study with four other institutions in the UK. And we found that there was a huge reliance on educators providing everything for students. Uh, and that makes me wonder, do you think instead of, um, or in parallel of, uh, of looking at OER uh, or open education practice, if there is a need perhaps for curriculum redesign so that open is, is part of the, the learning landscape, if you like, instead of an add-on? You know, that's an excellent question and I can answer to that. Actually, in 2017, the national curriculum was changed by the federal government, and the idea of it was to incorporate technology. And to my surprise, this curriculum went into effect in 2020, and they did not provide teacher professional development. So the teachers adopted this new curriculum they had to adopt this new curriculum and they haven't e even been trained. So that's the reality we're dealing with. I mean, it just doesn't make sense, right? A new curriculum goes into effect, which is supposed to, um, you know, lead teachers to, to incorporate ICTs and so on in their lessons, contextualize better their, their topics. And this curriculum goes into effect in 2020 you know, during the, the beginning of the pandemic with no support. So yes, Chrissy, uh, I, I think that this should be incorporated, but at this point, um, this might be something that might be included in my framework. So I think your question really makes sense. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Chrissy, I'm sorry for uh, skipping your question. Uh, so now, no time for Michael. Okay, thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Uh, I didn't know how many people were going to be here, so I set up like a little bit of a back channel for comments, but we'll probably just get to them in session. But that's there if you want to do it. You can do it anonymously if you feel um, that helps, and uh, I welcome it. And I'll leave it open after the session if you want to come back to that. So. Uh, I've been tweaking the title. Ugh, this is very much a work in progress. Um, uh, what I came up with this morning, identifying foundational skills for open education. Uh, we'll see if that sticks. Um, and I'll just share a little bit about my context. I'm on the west coast of BC on uh, Vancouver Island. This is Lekwungen territory. 
And I want to acknowledge um, with respect that territories that uh, I'm fortunate to be a settler on. Uh, it's really important here in the Canadian context dealing with uh, and addressing uh, issues of reconciliation. Um, so I definitely want to acknowledge that. Um, I am in my fourth year as an assistant professor in educational technology, very green, learning every day. Um, it's been a roller coaster of learning over the past few years. I get to work, I have the privilege and honor, and it's just so fortunate to be able to work with future teachers and current teachers, future teachers in our teacher education uh, programs, K through 12 largely, um, and then current teachers through our master's programs. And some of them are higher ed, but perhaps less than, um, than I would have expected, but that could change over time. Um, so it's really exciting. And it's also like such an opportunity to seed open education uh, with teachers who are going into K to 12. And um, I often find, I don't know if others who work in K to 12 feel this way, that K to 12 is more of an innovative space for teaching and learning. Uh, that might be contentious, but um, higher ed sometimes is a little slower, um, at least in my context and what I've seen. So there's a real opportunity to work with um, open practices and seed some of those literacies early. Of course, I'm also a very fortunate and proud, grateful Gojian member like Vivian and Catherine. Um, it changed the course of my PhD, basically. It was very lonely at the beginning and it just blew blew my mind um, when I first had the chance to engage in 2017. So very, very grateful and happy to have this way to connect again because I've been struggling with a busy workload and trying to find ways to be part of the network um, in, a, in a way. I always watch the webinars, but I don't often get to, to, to be there. And so um, this gives me some impetus and a way to give back. And I'm hoping that that will be part of this as well. So just getting into the research of this project, you know, probably some of you have heard this from me before. Um, I've been working with OERs for some time, but I'm really interested in how it can be a catalyst or if it can be a catalyst for innovation in teaching and learning and how does the availability of um, open education change what we can do as educators and what we can ask learners to do in terms of um, how they show their learning. So um, lots of little quotes here from the literature that have really um, driven my thinking. One even from Rob just published this week, <laughs> looking at innovation in teaching and learning. So um, it's happening. And of course, as I said, teacher candidates, those folks who will be the next generation of teachers um, are really great candidates to think about open practices and um, seed some of those ideas. Also, I think, and maybe another um, contentious statement, but we often end up teaching the way we were taught. <laughs> so um, if we can you know, demonstrate some of the open practices ourselves and we can have teachers in schools demonstrate some of the potential for open ed for creativity and network formation. Um, we give our future learners quite a nice opportunity for um, engaging as well. Uh, I've done a little research with my students. This is a small study, but just looking at awareness of some of the um, open concepts and there's pretty limited um, understanding, like all the words make sense, but um, they can't quite uh, put a finger on, well, what is that? And what does it mean? And how does it change what I can do? Um, so that's just a little bit of a um, preliminary study I did for this. And so I kind of want to, and I changed this as well, to look at what are some of the like foundational literacies for open educators that we could engage future teachers with. Um, you know, it's, I'd like to think about it through the lens of technology as well as pedagogy and then um, content um, in how we source and then prioritize different voices in um, different disciplinary areas. 
and that's um, drawn from this framework that if you haven't seen this, it's a very popular framework for um, teachers thinking through the ways that they can combine what they know about the discipline that they teach, how and the pedagogies that make sense to teach in that area, and then what technologies might uh, round out um, their approach to digital pedagogy. Uh, so it's a very common framework. Um, and teachers seem to like it. I, I noticed with teacher candidates, they really like something they can hold on to that has some sort of um, literature behind it or is established in some way or just kind of makes sense. So I thought, can we evolve this model <laughs> to thinking through some more of the specific things around open education? And the question doesn't have an answer yet. I don't know for sure. I do know that lots of people have tried to tackle um, the kind of the modeling of open practice. Uh, Catherine here in the room has made a really important contribution um, to this space as well. This is not a comprehensive list because I'm sure there's many I've missed. Um, so people have been trying to kind of identify this for some time. And the approach I'm taking one could say, do we need another one? <laughs> but I'm kind of looking for something that I can use in my teaching um, and others could use too, if it, if it was useful. Part of the feedback I got from OER 22, um, there, this is really interesting and I've, I've been thinking a lot about it and I just thought I'd share it with you because it does, it does put a little bit of a pause <laughs> in my trajectory in terms of, you know, do we want to get too specific? Because um, this is really, uh, you know, it's such a multifaceted uh, area and space. So perhaps the contribution I can make is in looking at teacher candidates rather than sort of a broad model. Um, so it might have to be kind of localized for how do you introduce um, uh, this to new teachers? Um, but there's lots of other people doing that as well. Uh, Creative Commons has their certificate program that focuses largely on licenses. And I am interested in the pedagogy side as well. And then last week, Quantlet launched a professional program in open education. I don't know if folks have heard about that, but that's a big initiative. And it looks like it's almost gonna be like a, a, a micro-credential for anybody who wants to do work in open ed. It's pretty interesting. And then um, I think, Helen is part of our network. She's doing really interesting work in her PhD, looking at a similar space around open practices among teacher, teacher educators. So I just wanted to give a nod to that work that's happening and I'm positive there'll be some synergies with some of the things we're doing. So I'm gonna try. Uh, the research uh, and the fellowship happens quickly as I'm sure our, my colleagues uh, are seeing as well as those and perhaps Brina, you'll tell us how to be pragmatic in moving things forward in the six month term. But I'm hoping, and I'm already into literature. Um, I'm using Envivo for literature review. I don't know if anybody's done that, but you can just drag all your articles into Envivo and code them just like you would an interview and it really can streamline the process. So I'd be happy to share on that. Um, I do, I got, I'll be at OER 22 in a pre recorded, I guess. and. Um, I'm looking at surveys or interviews to collect kind of the priorities around pedagogy, technology, and content for open educators. Uh, Delphi approach is something I'm exploring as well. Uh, I've been a part of that, but not, um, I haven't run one myself. And then I'll be at the Pan Commonwealth Forum. <laughs> if anybody's going to be there, it's in, uh, I think it's in Alberta in um, September. And hopefully by then I'll have something um, to share and maybe I'll even be there in person. Can you imagine? Um, we'll see, but um, that's where I'm at and um, I'll leave it there. So we have some time for questions and I'd love to hear from you about how this all sounds. Sounds great. And uh, yeah, time for some questions. Michael, I can see one hand. Yes. Yes, Jess. Yes, yes. Okay. 
<laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, really, really interesting project proposal. It was nice to see TPAC come back. I feel like, I don't know, I've got an affinity with that, that framework. Um, I'm right now in the process of analyzing my um, data from my dissertation research, which was looking at student perceptions, learner perceptions of OERP and OEP generally. And something's coming up that I didn't anticipate. I feel it might translate to novice teachers or educators generally. And that's a real lack of understanding between um, attribution and Creative Commons licensing, copyright, intellectual property, um, it's muddy. So students are saying things to me like, I want to apologize for not openly licensing my project work. I felt like I put so much effort into it. I wanted credit, attribution. Um, so there's obviously a disconnect in knowledge there. So I'm looking at that TPEC TPAC Venn diagram, and I'm wondering where do you think copyright and IP type education knowledge practices might sit? And my suspicion is it does not sit in there in a comfortable way. And teacher education isn't preparing us to have the knowledge we need to understand copyright, not just from an open perspective, but even from um, like a uh, Fair, fair dealings or fair use type perspective as well for copy uh, all rights reserved content. So anyway, I wondered if you had a comment there. Yeah, it's a great, great observation, Justin. I've also that content and technology. There's a lot of I don't know where to. I, I mean, I'm I'm looking to the to the research to kind of hopefully answer some of those questions, but there is a lot of crossover. I it's kind of a bit of a technology issue, but it's also quite a bit of a content issue. Um, so I don't actually know. The, the problem with copyright is that everybody knows it for the really unfortunate reasons, like don't be a pirate and all of these kinds of, all the messages we see on the walls and campuses around um, the world. I've, uh, we, we, we don't celebrate the opportunity. We look at um, shutting things down. So uh, there's a real tension there. Uh, I haven't quite reconciled it. Thank you, yes. Uh... Uh, Virina, I think you were next. Hi, Michael. So I really love your topic and I could feel like the emotions coming up. Um, so it was good, good. You got a visceral reaction from me, which is, it was good. So my dissertation research focused on like open learning design, which I didn't see really coming up there. And I thinking maybe that's what you're getting at, or maybe it's not. So I was a little confused from an instructional design, learning design point of view. And then I wondered why the focus on the content in K-12. And I asked that because in my dissertation research, what came up was actually Cronin's open readiness and, and the students, what that means for them. And for me, it was students and a little bit of the teacher. They, you're right, they have no understanding of OER, <laughs> CC licensing, but do they need it? I'm really curious, like, I don't know. And I wonder if that is part of the research and part of the questions that you might be asking, or is it more about experiencing open learning and, and using open educational practices and where does that get you? And maybe that's my bias. So that's why I got this visceral approach for me, because I'm like, how exciting. I saw lots of questions for you. I don't know which way you're going. I think that's so maybe I'd like more clarity in the blog post that I will be reading as we go <laughs> along. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me do it there, because I don't really have an answer right now. It's very early days. And uh, I am interested in learning design. That's part of the pedagogy component. Like, and there is a relation like what can, now that you have open content, what can you turn into what can you do in terms of your pedagogical approach or what can you ask learners to do so I haven't quite. Uh, um, yeah i'll try to kind of draw that up and perhaps another conversation would help with with you as well, because I know you have a strong interest here. Okay, Catherine. Um, thanks, Paco. Um, thank you, Michael. Really enjoyed the presentation. I have lots of thoughts, but I'm looking at the time and I know we have more presentations. So um, I just wanted to respond to one of your questions, which was uh, something along the lines of, you know, how do you deal with the fact that people like frameworks and models, but there's a lot of complexity, right? So 
I, I, I just think that uh, it's not a binary of really, you know, do a model or no model, but like a model embedded in something like principles or, you know, where you question. And I've um, talked with another group about doing this with learning design models, you know, like using a given learning design model, but then asking, you know, who's left out and, you know, what, what else could we be doing? And, you know, these kinds of principles as the nest of, of any model. I think helps deal with that complexity. But I hope that you and Viv and I and others will have more conversations after today. So that was just a brief reaction. But yeah, let's super. Organize. Let, let's self organize. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. Okay. I would be happy to. Thank you. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Uh, Chrissy? Yes, thank you, Michael. Very interesting, and will be useful to see what what uh, you will find. I had a similar question to what Catherine was asking because um, what you call foundational literacies made me think about digital literacies and the range of frameworks. For example, published by JISC for many years now have come out. How we can utilize these perhaps to to adapt to, and to shape. But also what Catherine said about principles made me think about values. Uh, and their place in, in anything uh, that will come out of your research potential. Just some thoughts, I think, at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you Chrissy. I, I think um, maybe looking to the literature will help a little bit. And that feedback, I think, has given me a lot of pause as well as this feedback. So, so thanks to everyone um, for the feedback. Thank you. So yeah, I, I think at, at this point, I, I would like to thank the, the three presenters, the three new fellows. Uh, I do hope the, the feedback uh, uh, was useful. Uh, the presentations were very clear, very professional, and we are actually on time, which is great as well. And uh, now we are gonna uh, have a, a different uh, type of uh, presentation. In this case, with uh, Lina, who is one of our fellows from the second core, uh, which just finished. And uh, I think it's nice if uh, Belina, uh, can uh, you please introduce your uh, fellowship to us. Can you see the screen? Yes. This will be shorter, just so we all know <laughs> short. So the goal is to connect what you're doing, not talking a lot about mine. So I worked with a, a student from one of my courses on the Into the Open podcast series, and the student's name is Nicole Nutzling, and she's not able to be here today, but she lives in British Columbia, and I just, I too, um, I respectfully wanted to acknowledge that I'm situated on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the First Nations and Métis people. And what's really um, exciting about this is growing up, I grew up in Edmonton, so I'm home. I am where I grew up, so this is where my home is. But we did not respectfully acknowledge that we were situated on territories as invited or uninvited guests as I was growing up. So I looked at this photo I took of the North Saskatchewan River, which just shows you how icy it still is here in Canada and cold, but the river has flowed through the city, the North Saskatchewan, and um, it, it gives me a sense of being home, and, and but also a sense that things move on, and, you know, we need to respectfully think about other people's perspectives of the river and other people's experiences with the land. So um, I'm going to go over the very brief project timeline. Nicole, um, pulled this uh, PowerPoint together and she split it up into learning. So this is when we collected our resources and in interviews and in an online survey to just develop the understanding of podcasting in general. Then we refined our content focus and reached out to possible guests. Many of them are in the room today in the online room. Um, we developed the content and edited. And this was where my project and Paco will smile or not smile kind of took a turn. Um, as we know, in open educational practices, power control, <laughs> um, who has power and control can change, especially if the original um, facilitator wants to encourage student learning and multiple learning pathways. So at the build stage, Nicole started going in one direction with the project and Verena was going in another and we were in the same project. And I know with Chrissy, who inspired this project for doing something different, 
we, we were all together with the uh, collaborative book project most of the time. And she really has a really amazing ability to keep people together as you go along the stage. There were only two of us. And at this point in the build, I would say we were doing different projects. So that's really what happened. So then what, after that, we produced seven uh, podcasts and I took more of an observer role. I stood back and I supported Nicole as she created the podcast and I helped her create the questions and I did all those kinds of things. Um, and we uploaded the podcast series. And this actually was one of my biggest learnings. Well, Nicole's biggest learning, she would say, was developing and editing the podcast themselves. Mine was actually putting or uploading podcast series into an OER repository and doing it correctly through a library was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. So I think that's really important because it's not easy. It, and it, we need to make that process easier. So everything along the way in terms of creativity and making took a lot of work. The podcasts probably nearly killed poor Nicole as she was making them. Then finally, we get to the end after our eight months, and we collected the feedback on the podcast and we developed resources for educators wishing to produce and research open podcasts. And guess what? Now I'm doing the research now. And that's really important for the fellows. <laughs> Oops, I just spat on my own computer. Um, the fellows need to understand or just feel free knowing that this will take its own time. You don't have just six months, as we well know, go as a community and a learning community, and it, they will support you when you need your help. So I feel really good knowing that Nicole managed to finish the project, and she ha we have our, our podcast, but I finally have my research question. Again, Paco will smile, and probably Martin because they, they were rolling their eyes, I'm sure, throughout this process. To what extent can open learning design influence a graduate student's experience with open educational practices beyond the completion of a course? So that's really what I was looking at. And now I have a case study approach where I can pull together the experiences. I'm not quite sure if it's an ethnographic case study, so I'm still trying to figure out. I was part of the process, but how much was I of the live process? So I have to figure that out. But what I really want to do is look at the transcripts and go through an ethical review process and write that up on, on going through ethics to get permission to use the transcripts in a different way, which is to come in from my angle and my lens with my research question. And then that's how I'm going to finish up the project. So that basically summarizes where I'm at. And boy, it has been quite a journey. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very good summary. Um, so now we have time to discuss together. Uh, I have some questions, and uh, but I think it's going to be much more interesting if anyone uh, from the participants wants to um, ask uh, and say anything. That's great. So we can have kind of a conversation all together. And uh, for the fellows for the third court, and as well, we got Chrissy, who is from the first court. Uh, so any kind of, of, of uh, question or any kind of information that can be handy for, for your uh, very personal journey. But uh, yeah, so I'm going to raise the first question, Verena, and then uh, if you have to uh, let us know after all this process, what you have actually learned from, from the fellowship? I've learned to trust the process. Isn't that funny? But I think like we, you know, I, I went in to it thinking one, this was the way the research was gonna go. And that's so my personality as well. But I think the, the pandemic and open research highlights or amplifies that it's the research and the process that takes you to your, your answers and your understanding. That's great. And I, think that, and I think as well, you, you were quite clear. And I think none of the fellows so far really followed the proposal. <laughs> <laughs> good point, Becca. None of us really did. And Christy, well, maybe it was a good thing or bad thing that I was involved with Christy. So she was the one going off on different rabbit holes too. And it's just, it will, I don't anticipate that you will finish with what you start with. <laughs> That's what I guess. Christy, do you have more to yes. say on that? I think we did. I think we did uh, do what we promised. We said we would create a picture book and we did. So what are you talking about? <laughs> I have no idea. But I think what uh, Verena says, going with the flow 
uh, being flexible, elastic, uh, adaptive, and resourceful to problem solve, but also being honest with GoGN, with, with any colleagues you work with, I think, and, and open about the process is, I think, fundamental. Yes, and there will be surprises on the way, there will be hurdles, as there always are, but I think we learn through these challenges, uh, see them as opportunities for learning, <laughs> which I'm sure you will all be doing. <laughs> Well, and that's one of the questions. What are the challenges? It's in the notes and the answer, you know, the questions that you fill out. And I remember saying to Beck, oh, there'll be no challenges. I don't know. You know? <laughs> this seems like an easy project, but you make a good point, Chrissy. We did what we said we were going to do. We got the podcast done, but I didn't anticipate the learning outcome. I think that's the difference. So what did you enjoy the most? from your fellowship? Watching a student, a, pre, a, a student transition and transform into an open learning advocate, um, the pride and confidence that she brought, and then having the opportunity to connect with like Catherine's or Chrissy's or Leo's and find out what was really needed from me as an instructor in order to support a student in transforming. And I, I, I didn't necessarily recognize that without chatting to others and finding out more. So that's what I love the most. It's always great when you see others thrive and, and build confidence in open learning. <laughs> that's actually great. And I think as well, uh, uh, the relationship with, uh, with uh, Nicole and, and getting to know the processes has been very, very handy for, for future research. And, and collaboration as well but yeah i think you already kind of answered this question but what did you find more difficult the whole project was difficult uh, the hardest thing was admitting that the project was going in another direction and i and figuring out how to be okay with that and knowing that i was going to learn something and get something out of it but it was just that i couldn't figure out what it was in that moment i just had to let it happen <clears throat> Catherine, you would like to ask something? I, I just want to say thank you to Brina for being such a genuinely open learner. You always are, but just in this particular context, you know, there's three of us who are starting something that's new for us and, you know, all quite different and we're at different stages. You know, I don't even know who my third partner is or whatever, but, you know, the fact that you're kind of humbly saying what happened to you and you do that all the time. So, you know, there, there's open and then there's just kind of living and doing your work in that way. And you do that. So I, I appreciate that. And Chrissy as well. So I'm really grateful for that. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. That's kind. Um, I think GoGN more than any other fellowship encourages you to do that, though. And so I deeply appreciate that. Like, really try to, to, to think, reflect upon the what you think are mistakes or whatever's not going well, because it's gold. And we know that, we all know that, we read about it, we know the theory, <laughs> we know that, but like when it happens, oh, not so much fun. <laughs> and yeah, as you have, as you, you said in your presentation, uh, uh, we have six months, but it doesn't mean you don't have all this data and all this experience you can uh, keep on working with. Uh, in, uh, in the future, and, and that seems, it seems very important in your case. All the process you have learned, the fact that you have produced uh, the podcast, and now you know how to uh, produce podcasts, which isn't straightforward, and you have learned the hard way. And and uh, and yeah, all, all this data to, to uh, think about publications or future steps. So what are the next steps, Marina? my next steps are literally i'm really excited about finally doing the research part like getting in and coding and looking at the transcripts <laughs> i mean we are researchers and so it was it was odd to be in doing the research for so long <laughs> but knowing that is the time now i have the data now i can look into it so those are next steps so i can get that article done and then keep going and keep that wonderful relationship with Nicole going to, for sure. That's great. Uh, Vivian? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to thank Verena for a very honest <laughs> uh, feedback. And, you know, um, 
having done my own uh, doctoral dissertation in, in such a tough setting as Brazil and I mean, Chrissy knows what I went through, right? So I already expected this to be difficult. Um, the fellowship is even more challenging because we only have six months. And uh, so it's a good advice that you give that, you know, we will not hand in, I think, a perfect piece of research with perfect findings at the end. We will do our, our, our best. Uh, to get that done, but like six months is really, you know, not, not, not optimum time to do that. So thank you, Verena, for being so honest. Um, I, I really didn't expect the fellowship to be any different uh, because I went through literally hell during my doctoral dissertation. So I kind of expect to be, to be tough, but I would really like to get more participants on board and I'm going to continue doing that even though I already have four and, and more come up. So these are my comments. And I think we learn a lot from our subjects all the time and so on. So yeah, forth. but if I think you're right, just wait for more because I think that's what I learned just, and this, maybe that's the pandemic teaching us too. Things will happen, like Catherine said, she, you know, she's getting that third group in, it's gonna happen, but I don't feel like you're rushing it. Catherine, I think that's more important because you're finding the right connection and the right, and I know Chris did that too. In her example, it was finding the, the illustrator. There was a whole story about that. But it ended up being Chrissy and she learned so much through Brian and, and other, so yeah, it will come. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think uh, well, this has been a learning process for all of us uh, and, and uh, talking from Gojian as well, because we designed the fellowship scheme with a kind of one idea, so supporting uh, PhD, I mean, just uh, new alumni to, to start with their career, maybe doing something uh, related to the PhD, or as well uh, ways to disseminate the network uh, uh, but that was kind of tricky because of the pandemic, the second one. So, and we 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 got new ideas, uh, new proposals that were completely different to uh, our original idea. And as well, we realized that, uh, yeah, uh, offering uh, cohorts and and uh, timeframes it might not be uh, helpful for everyone. And uh, maybe adopting uh, more agile approaches in the future can 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 be more supportive and. So that is a learning process, and uh, and well, I don't know you uh, any. Do uh, you have any other question for Verena? Any participant, uh, Michael? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Verena. That really helps in terms of. I also was like, oh, how is this going to come together? I feel like with your analogy, I've put my foot in the water, and it's it's rushing by me, and the feedback's rushing by me, reshaping the direction I'm going to go. Um, I feel like a bit of a um, struggling upstream, but I, the thing I love about this program is that it gives you an explicit way to be open in the research from the get-go. Um, you know, some of the research projects I've been involved with are just very, you know, just just logistically they're they're not that widely available. Um, so I'm really excited about having this opportunity to put it out there, have it almost like it's almost a collaboration in a way because we're all giving the feedback as we go and i guess that's just one question i had about the next step um do we meet again is there formal um ways for us to update i know catherine and Vivian, and i Vivian and i've been talking about self-organizing um just curious how we we go forward so i definitely think uh the fact that we are already in the third court, it gives this option that we know people who have been through the process and and I think it's great we can kind of coordinate the communication. So it's not something we have really uh, formalized, but, and uh, yeah, I mean, what we try to do in our courts is uh, giving the opportunity to present the, the research within the community. And then you will have the opportunity to do it uh, in the broader OER community in the, or 22 and yeah uh, keeping we are going to be keeping regular uh, contact with the, uh, you with the team all of you uh, but I, I agree probably we have to think about ways uh, uh, of synergies between uh, uh, fellows 
if that was your question. Michael, connect with other people too. Oh, sorry for interrupting. Um, I know Sarah was my fellow fellow, <laughs> um, but we were doing very different studies. So we could connect in terms of what you're feeling, like, you know, being overwhelmed, but the topics were very different. So I had to turn to others within my community for support, like, like Chrissy and Catherine and and Helen, yeah, there you're right. You but you can see you're doing that already in the way you set up your slides. So you're well on your way. Um, I, look, I I just wanted to suggest, and I have to I have to go because I am going to be interviewing a person now at two thirty Brazil time. So um, Catherine and Michael, uh, I would be open um, if you guys would like to meet and, and exchange ideas. We can surely set up, you know, uh, Zoom talks between the three of us, and 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 I'm sure Chrissy would like to help us as well. I know Chrissy is very welcome, and Verena, you're also welcome to join since you're in K twelve, and I think that leaves up a less burden for you know the GoGen, Paco, and back to be constantly providing us feedback. So I'd like to suggest that I'm open to meeting. Uh, we can try to, you know, because I think we're all three on different like time frames in our proposals. So I would be open. And with that, I uh, it's been really a pleasure. I really have to go guys. Otherwise, you know, I might miss on interviewing my fourth participant today. <laughs> So it was like a, a great pleasure being here today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paco. Thank you, Beck. Thank you, Gojen. And thank you, all wonderful members. Keep safe. Thanks, Viv. We'll talk soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Hello, fellowship doesn't stop for you, don't they? <laughs> and indeed, I'm aware of time. So I think uh, we can uh, close the session. Uh, I think it's been quite uh, amazing to have all representations from the third court, uh, this conversation uh, with Irina. And, and I think, I do hope uh, the feedback was was useful for new fellows. And uh, yeah, definitely we keep in touch and uh, we uh, please contact us for any, any question and any doubt, any query. We are very flexible and easygoing, as you already know. And uh, I'm just gonna share some of the next events coming. Um, if I remember how to share again. Um, so what's happening next? So we have uh, OER 22 in April, and we are going to have our uh, first face-to-face -face, uh, workshop, Monday 25th of April. Uh, quite an interesting experience and, uh, and strange at some point as well. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, just in case, please spread the word. We are having the Gaudian uh, colleague. Uh, I can see the, the corrector changed my, the Latin word colleague, uh, but actually it means colleague, uh, means a, a colleague in Spanish and Portuguese. So is the next phase of the EDI project uh, which seeks to find mentor and mentorees uh, uh, working in publications in English for those whose uh, mother tongue is Spanish or Portuguese. And then line is this Friday, 18 March. So all info uh, on our website and uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your time.